and I am the director of the History and Literary Arts Program at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. The NHCC is dedicated to the preservation, promotion, and advancement of Hispanic Latinx culture, arts, and humanities, and we are a division of the State of New Mexico Department of Cultural Affairs. I'd like to acknowledge that New Mexico is comprised of the ancestral and unceded land of 19 sovereign Pueblo nations, as well as three Apache tribes and the Navajo nation, Diné. We are indebted to the caretakers of this land and to the land itself. We are also dedicated to engagement with complex issues of history, culture, and heritage. We believe that this kind of engagement is at the heart of cultural understanding and promotes a legacy that is dedicated to justice and reconciliation. Bienvenidos, everyone. I'm joined tonight by staff members in the History and Literary Arts Program, Anna Uramovich, who takes care of all the logistics and coordinates this series, Cassandra Osterlo, our NHCC Zoom tech and our librarian, and Patricia Perea, if the three of you would wave, who's our HLA educator. We're really excited. Hi. To, we're really excited to host this series, Perspectivas Modernas Latin America, in collaboration with the University of New Mexico Department of History, Center for the Southwest and Latin American and Iberian Institute. Liz Hutchison and I started cooking up the idea for a Latin America series last fall, and her colleagues and mine have been very generous in joining in to put this series together. Um, we're really grateful for their partnership. From our perspective at the NHCC, we wanted to expand our history and literary arts programming even more deeply into countries outside the US with a focus not only on history, but on relevant and important contemporary issues. Through May uh, of this spring, talks happen on the second Tuesday of the month. This is our third and our last one will be next month. We hope you'll join us each time. And at the end of this program, I'll give you a little bit more information about the May talk. Now I'd like to introduce Francis Hayashida, director of the Latin American Iberian Institute at UNM to say a few words. Francis? Hi. Uh... I believe uh, Sam was going to do the, the welcome this evening on behalf of UNM. Oh, sorry about that. Sam, you're That's up. okay. I can, I can be Francis if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. On behalf of UNM's Latin American and Iberian Institute, the Department of History, and the Center for the Southwest, welcome to tonight's talk. We are delighted to be here to help share exciting new scholarship in Latin America by UNM faculty. And it's a great privilege for us to partner with the National Hispanic Cultural Center and to spend time with all of you this evening. Thank you. I will now pass the Zoom mic over to Anna Uramovic from the National Hispanic Cultural Center. Hello, everyone. I'm Anna Uramovic, and here are a few housekeeping notes. Our speaker will present for about 30 to 45 minutes. It will be followed by a 15 minute question and answer session. During the presentation, all of you will be muted, so there will be no background noise or interruptions. After the talk, we will open the chat box for questions and comments. We will field the questions and present them to our speaker. Right now, you may want to take a pen and paper and write down questions that pop up to you during the presentation, so you can pop them in the chat box later. At the end of this session, we will share details about next month's talk and also provide a link in the chat box that allows you to take a quick one minute feedback survey. The survey tells us about your experience with this event and enables us to be responsive to your needs. Thank you in advance for this. Now, um, I would like to pass it on. Um, I thought it was Samuel. Samuel, are you doing the introduction? I'm actually introducing Rhonda this evening. That's why we had a little flip there. Uh, if you would uh, take it away and introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Anna. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Rhonda Brulot. Professor Brulot is Associate Professor of Geography and Environmental Studies and Director of Latin American Studies at the University of New Mexico. She is the author of Between Art and Artifact, Archaeological Replicas and Cultural Production in Oaxaca, Mexico, and co-editor of Edible Identities, Food as Cultural Heritage. 
Tonight, we'll be hearing about her current research and book project on the transformation of the mezcal industry in Oaxaca, Mexico. So please join me in welcoming Professor Brulat. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to pull up my share screen and hopefully this will work. There it is. Um, so thank you uh, both to the LAII and to the NHCC for having me. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I was thinking this is also, it was just a great excuse to wash my hair <laughs> for once. I just like, wow, I get to get dressed up, put on earrings. So I, it feels like an event here in my own house. Um, so thank you. Um, tonight, what I want to do is provide a little overview of uh, Oaxacan mezcal, which is um, a topic that I've been working on now uh, for, gosh, I started in 2011, so a good solid 10 years. Um, and one of the reasons I think uh, Oaxacan mezcal is, is interesting is that even when I started doing this work back in 2011, um, if I had asked most people probably on the screen, most people in Albuquerque, what they knew about mezcal, um, they'd say things like, oh, that's that gut rot, or that's that thing with the worm in the bottle, or that's that really smoky tequila that tastes like garbage. You know, um, there was very little information and very few opportunities to even get mescal, try mescal here in Albuquerque, Albuquerque, even though it was sort of filtering in through coastal cities um, on the east and the west coast. Um, and in that 10 years, I've seen mezcal go from being something pretty obscure here to uh, something that is very popular and it's popped up on, on menus um, around the state. It's something you can now buy at Jubilation Spirits. Um, they used to have one bottle for sale and you'd ask the guy that owned the place and he didn't know anything about it. And he said he sold like one a year um, and now they have a little aisle of mezcal. Um, so I think it's something that is, in a, in a very short period of time, went from being virtually unknown in much of the United States to something that is um, quickly becoming uh, uh, kind of the, the, the it girl of, of, of the craft spirits world. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Oaxacan mezcal as craft um, and the art of making mezcal. And I'm using these terms art and craft um, for a particular reason, and that is, I think, fundamentally, the nature of mezcal production and what has made it sort of skyrocket in popularity is precisely um, the kind of craft techniques, the, the rustic production systems um, that are kind of the foundation of the industry. And that positions it kind of alongside a lot of other craft foods, artisanal foods. And I think those foods are having their moment. And I think part of that moment is Oaxacan mezcal. So I'm gonna, let's see here. My computer's not letting me, there it goes. Um, I'm gonna assume probably some people um, on this call have been to Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, if not, I'll, I'll pull up a map here in a few slides and you can um, see where it's located within the country. Um, but Oaxaca is, kind of the, the place most associated with mezcal. It produces, depending on who you talk to, some, somewhere between 80 and 90% of all of Mex Mexico's mezcal. Um, and you know, it's, it's something when you go to, to Oaxaca now, it kind of hits you in the face. It's sold everywhere. There's bars ded dedicated to it. Um, but I wanna go back in time a little bit and make it really clear that even in Oaxaca, just, 10 or 15 years ago, mezcal was not popular. And I say that with a caveat that it was popular among certain groups of people. And those groups of people were primarily rural communities, um, oftentimes indigenous communities. Uh, it was very much viewed as a drink of the rural poor or the urban working classes. It was not something that middle-class and upper-class Oaxacans or Mexicans more generally drank. Right? It had a really negative stigma attached to it. And there's historical reasons for that, but it was really a kind of a, a, a class and racial ethnic stigma that was, was tied to mezcal. Um, and so, you know, it was something that you'd go to a, 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 the country and, you know, 
maybe a rural fiesta and they might have mezcal, but it wasn't something you would drink necessarily at a bar in a place like Oaxaca City or Mexico City, and certainly not in New York City. Um, a lot of the mezcal, um, and particularly the mezcal I'm gonna sort of highlight here today is uh, really, you know, you might call it moonshine if it were in the United States. It's very small scale producers, um, backyard producers, sometimes the term is used. Um, people making very small batches um, to consume or sell um, in their communities. Um, their production facilities are, are very simple in many cases. Uh, you can see one here that I visited in the Mishtek region of Oaxaca State. Um, it's really just a few tanks, a tarp, uh, you know, it, a few tools to help him grind. Um, but these are these are not large commercial production facilities in many cases. So this is kind of historically the context in which mescal was produced. That is changing, and I'll get back to that point a little bit later in the presentation. But this is sort of the, the way that mescal for the most of its history was made. Um, and again, consumed locally by the same people that made it or people in the community that made it. What are we seeing now? Well, mescal has gone global. Um, you can go to Sydney, you can go to Geneva, you can go to New York City, and you can go to places like this where they have tasting menus. And it's this one's this bar in New York City is actually a replica of a bar that's in Oaxaca City. It's the same odor, owner. He's a very famous artist. Um, and he has this sort of binational business model and he, you know, he moves between Oaxaca and New York City and so has Mescal now moves between Oaxaca and New York City. So what started out as very, you know, local now has moved into this global market. And so um, Mescal is now associated with um, what I would call cosmopolitanism, this, this taste for the world, right? These uh, people that are citizens of the world and want to try the flavors of the world, right? And that includes alcoholic spirits. So I wanna talk quickly about what is mescal here? And this are, these are some of the points I'm gonna to try to hit on in the short time we have this evening. I wanna first talk about, uh, you know, what is its relationship to other uh, alcoholic drinks from native to Mexico? Um, and the age old question, what's the difference between te uh, tequila and mezcal? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the denomination of origin and the regulatory framework for mezcal because that's really key to defining it and then the marketing of it. And then I want to talk about um, the, the question of standardization versus craft and where does mezcal fit in this dichotomy that's often made. So this is a question I often get is, is mezcal something people were drinking here in the Americas before the Spanish got here? Um, this is a controversial topic because there are, is an emerging group of researchers in Mexico that um, are claiming through archeological evidence that there was actually um, distillation technology um, in the new world prior to the arrival of the Spanish. Um, it is not widely accepted. The, the conventional story is still that distillation was a technology brought um, as part of the Columbian exchange, which was the exchange of, of goods and technologies between the old world and the new. Um, and that begins at the, the conquest of the Americas. Um, that said, people in Mesoamerica and Latin America more generally um, we're making fermented alcoholic beverages, right? Um, and there's a long history. We, we have evidence, um, many codices from uh, uh, Mesoamerican codices um, depict people drinking um, something called pulque, which is a fermented agave drink. Um, and so Pulque is the thing that is pre-Hispanic. Mezcal and its cousins, its distilled cousins, um, came later, okay? Um, and this is just a picture here. Um, you can see uh, a man, he's, what you do is you take the sap out of the um, agave and you 
let it ferment and that's how you get the pulque versus um, many of the distilled alcohols, you actually cut the plant, you're using the plant matter, you're not just taking out the sap. So it's actually a different process to ferment and get pulque than it is to distill and get tequila, sotol and all these other distilled, um, distilled drinks. Okay. Um, so those of you that are familiar with Mexico or traveled to Mexico, you may have encountered um, some of these other drinks. Not only um, does Mexico produce tequila, probably one of the most famous drinks, it also produces mezcal and some other drinks that are starting to become um, more well-known in the United States. Um, one, it's, it's always surprising. We, we share a border with the state of um, Chihuahua and Chihuahua produces an alcoholic distilled drink named so, uh, Sotol, which is produced in a similar fashion to um, tequila and mezcal, but it's actually a different plant um, that is endemic to um, Northern Mexico and actually the Southwest. Um, a lot of people have Sotol plants as landscaping in their yards. Um, I always think, God, if we, somebody wanted to just go around and rob people's plants from their yards, they could just, you know, just go crazy distilling. Um, but this map is showing the distribution of um, the different alcohols in, in terms of their geography. Um, the region up here, there's a drink that's made from agave. It's called um, Bacanora. Um, then Sotol's made in um, Chihuahua, Coahuila. And Durango actually makes both um, Sotol and is it? I think the ones in yellow, the way the map is, are also the states that make. Oh, I see it's on the. Hmm. I'm trying to think how this is coded. Oops, go back. Um, anyway, losing my train of thought. Um, you'll see here that the, the green regions are the regions where mescal is produced. And that means that they have the denomination of origin to legally call it mezcal. It doesn't mean that people aren't making agave distilts in other places that may actually fit the criteria. It's just that those states, and I'll come back to what this means to have a denomination of origin. It means that they have um, a legal framework for the commercialization of their product as mezcal, okay? And um, you'll see here number 14, that is the state of Oaxaca. It's um, in Southern Mexico, and that's the the place where I've focused most of my research. Um, one of the interesting things about this is so much of the idea of the tequila and mezcal is that it's very place-based. Um, and it's this notion of, of the terroir is the French term, but that the place, the soil conditions, the climatic um, effects, the, the cultural knowledge, all of that goes into making the product. Um, and usually there's some sort of geographic um, coherence to that. And what you see here on the map, it really illustrates uh, the tension between that, that idea of what a geographic indication is supposed to be and the reality of the politics that determines who gets the, the, these um, indications. In that if you look at the, the sections that are green, right, you've got way down in Southern Mexico, and then you've got states up in the North. Um, and it's, you know, it's not uh, states that even border each other, very different microclimates, completely different. I mean, just very distinct. It's like having, saying, you know, Alabama and California, you know, are a, a terroir, right? It doesn't really make sense, but the politics of it in Mexico is what has determined um, which states get the, the um, designation for mezcal, tequila, et cetera. If you look at actually tequila, um, the state of Tamaulipas over number seven, not even anywhere close to the tequila region, they make tequila. Most people never associate Tamaulipas with tequila. Think of, I don't know, cartel violence, maybe, but they don't think of tequila, right? Tequila is from the highlands of Jalisco, but they have a, a, a designation and they can legally make tequila. Okay. Um, one of the other things that come up when talking about mezcal is, in, and I think it causes a lot of confusion for people, is that 
Mescal can mean two things. On one hand, it is an umbrella term under which you have any distilled alcohol made from agave. So by that definition, all tequila is mescal, okay? Um, mescal also refers to a specific, as I said, a denomination of origin, and I'll talk about what that is in a second. Um, and that is tied to those specific states that I just showed you on the last map. So, it, you know, you can talk about mescal in general, and before the 19th century, um, it was all referred to as mescal. It's only in the 19th century that tequila emerges as a placed-based um, uh, drink identity, I guess, is the, the, the term you could use. Um, so really, in the, the colonial period moving forward, the term mescal is referring to all these different agave distillates. Um, and then through time, you know, places develop their own unique terms that are very localized. Um, so um, mescal is not tequila, and tequila is only produced in certain regions, right? But tequila is an agave-based um, spirit, therefore tequila is mescal. So hopefully that clarifies a little bit. Now you know what those terms mean. Um, this, this shows just what I would consider kind of a, a, a typical uh, industrial tequila plant. This is for Espolón, which is a tequila you probably see, it's, you can probably buy it at Walgreens here. I think <laughs> it always catches my eye because it's got a great um, Posada graphic on the label. Um, and so it, it looks really cool. It's, it's a very, in my opinion, friendly tequila if you wanna make a margarita, but that's about it. Um, it's, I wouldn't say it's a great sipping, sipping tequila, um, but it's made here in, in, in a fairly large scale uh, facility. I wanted to point out in the, the background, those big metal looks like tubes. Those are autoclave ovens. And so that is where they cook the, um, what they call piñas, which is the agave hearts when they're cut. Um, and this is a key reason that mezcal tastes different from tequila. Most tequila um, is made from agave cooked in these big autoclave ovens. And that means that the agave is steamed rather than cooked. And I'll show you a picture in a minute of rather than cooked in these in-ground pits using firewood as fuel. And so that's where the smoky taste come from. So most tequila is never gonna have that smoky finish that you taste on the skull because they're cooked in ovens like the ones you see here on the slide. Okay. So denomination of origin, this is really key to defining mezcal. Um, and I don't want you to walk away thinking tonight that it only applies to these agave drinks, right? Um, denomination of origin is actually a wider system of protection that operates um, at the international level. Um, a geographical indicator right, um, refers to a product that is originating in a very specific area and there, it's believed that there has some quality or intrinsic characteristics that are tied to its geographic environment. And that includes both the natural environment and the human environment, right? Um, so natural environment, maybe, maybe in the case of a, a drink, you know, maybe it's the water, spring water from this place or this, the mineral content. When you talk about wine, people love talking about the soil or the, you know, the mineral content of the soil. Is it rocky? Is it sandy? All of that combines together with the, the human know-how and culture of making the product. And it's believed that that's a very special thing that needs to be protected in this framework. This idea of protecting place-based products um, emerges out of something um, called the Lisbon Agreement, um, which was a multilateral treaty um, signed um, at the international level in 1958. And what it did was it created a concept of the denomination of origin and a um, forum for providing legal protection um, through uh, an international registration system that is headed at the World Intellectual Property Organization. Right? 
This starts in Europe, right? Um, and you can think about uh, the most common things are like French cheese or wine, like Bordeaux can only be produced in the Bordeaux region or Parma ham can only be produced in Parma, Italy. Um, I've, one thing that never occurs to people, I think there's certain products that we associate as having a, a, a denomination of origin, um, but tomatoes that you go to the grocery store, um, it's, I've seen them become very popular, these San Marzano tomatoes. Those are actually a protected product. Um, you see ripoffs of it sometimes, or people like their San Marzano like tomatoes, or you know whatever it is they use to market them. But that is a specific protected product from Italy. It's a place-based product. Okay. Um, the denomination of origin in Mexico. Um, is actually, so this operates at both the international level and the federal level. Um, in Mexico, to have a denomination of origin, um, you have to register the product through, it's called INPIS, the, the acronym in Spanish is the Mexican Institute of Industrial Property. And then um, if it gets approved, it gets published in this sort of official venue and it is legally protected both within the country and any countries that are part of this Lisbon agreement. Um, in Mexico, it indicates usually a product in a territory if, it, if it's attached to a particular territory. Um, you can see over here, um, it's not just food and drink. Um, there are other things like amber from Chiapas is, has a denomination of origin. It's a protected product. Um, Olina, Ol, Ol, Olinala, uh, lacquerware, which is a, a, a very sort of iconic folk art, um, is also has a denomination of origin. You can't just make that anywhere you want, right, and call it, you know, the same thing. Um, curiously, the, the tequila was the first denomination of origin in Latin America, and it was established in 1974. So that's when tequila um, starts to become really visible in this global way and being branded as tequila. Um, mezcal doesn't get its own denomination of origin until much later in 1995. And coincidentally, or perhaps not coincidentally, 1995 is the first year that a man named Ron Cooper, who happens to live in Taos, New Mexico, starts importing the very first artisanal mezcal to the U.S under the brand Del Maguey, which you can still find um, all over, you know, bars and stores, they have it at Jubilation. Um, he's an artist and he is widely credited as being the founder of the artisanal um, uh, mezcal movement. So that all happens pretty recently, right? So in 1995, you start seeing it, um, but prior to that, you know, mezcal didn't really mean much um, and it certainly wasn't uh, a protected status of a product. Okay. So the current definition of mezcal, um, and this is important because unlike tequila, uh, the, uh, the, the official denomination of origin for mezcal is really broad. Um, tequila has to be made with one, there's one specific kind of agave, um, blue agave, sometimes you'll see it on bottles. And it only has to be 51% um, alcohol from blue agave, and it can be mixed with other alcohols. It can be sugar cane um, to get the name tequila. That's why you oftentimes see 100% blue agave on a tequila bottle, is they're trying to show you that it's got more, more of the real stuff than some of the other tequilas, right? Um, in, in, so in contrast with tequila, you have to have 100% agave, and it has to be using Mexican yeast, um, and it has to be um, from the cooked, the cooked maguey, which is just another word for agave. Um, and it has to be within those, those regions or those territories that fit under the, the denomination of origin. Um, why this is important is that this definition is really broad. It's really, really broad. It's broad in biological terms, it's broad in geographic terms, and it's really broad in its um, process. And I'll show you here what I mean in a second. Um, but what this creates, unlike tequila, is it creates all this room for 
um, individual innovation and sort of uh, craftsmanship that goes into it. Um, I would venture to say that no two mezcals taste alike um, because there are so many variables that go into making mezcal and there's so much room to play with those variables, you're never gonna get the same results. Even from brand to brand, from bottle to bottle and from batch to batch, it's all gonna be different because there is so much room for variation that there isn't in tequila. Um, just to show you even within the, 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 the biological diversity of the agaves, this map doesn't even begin to capture it, um, but they all, all throughout Mexico, there's um, you know, dozens of varieties, maybe hundreds probably varieties people haven't even um, named of, of different agave species. And um, all of these, are fair game to make mezcal. Unlike tequila, again, which there's one kind of agave you can use, mezcal, you can use pretty much anything you want, right? And you can use it any combination you want. So you could mix varieties of um, plants, right? And get some really interesting combinations. So there, the idea you're seeing now people blending, blending mezcals and, and cooking different kinds of agaves together and getting these really interesting flavor profiles that you don't get with tequila. Um, that said, still the most popular um, agave is uh, for making mezcal is what's called espadín. And um, you can see it being grown here. It's domesticated, so people farm it. Um, and it is probably, I'd say, I'm guessing most of the mezcal you would buy in the United States, although it's changing, um, it's probably made of espadín. Um, but even with espadín, Right, which is one variety, it's domesticated. Um, you get, there's interesting ways in which people craft new flavors out of the mezcal. And I'm just gonna show you a couple um, pictures here that I think kind of illustrate that idea of the way that people or the, the things in, the, in the, the culture process or the environment that can influence the kinds of flavors that you can get out of a drink. The, the bottom, um, left-hand corner um, is a picture of espadín and it's interspersed with other crops, which is actually a pretty common um, farming technique in Mesoamerica. It's called intercropping and people will often grow, you know, squash, corn, chili, um, beans, and they'll, they'll grow them together in the same field. And the idea is that the different plants um, uh, provide different um, things to the soil, right? Um, and people say that this intercropping can actually impact the flavor of the plant. So even though you've got a pretty generic farmed plant, because of the fact maybe it's growing with a certain type of chili, it could influence the way the plant tastes in the final product. Um, there are other things you can do in the distillation process. Um, there's a very um, popular form of mezcal called um, pechuga, which if you speak Spanish, you know, means breast. And it usually refers to either a chicken breast or a turkey breast. Um, and people say, do they really put a chicken breast in there? And yes, they really do put a chicken breast in there. You can see a pot here, they've tied it in there. And during the distillation process, it infuses, right? The steam and the vapors are in there and there, that little chicken breast is <laughs> infusing its flavor. And sometimes they'll put spices and I've seen people put fruits and apples. Um, quince, um, all kinds of things. Um, and it creates, again, it's like a cook making a recipe. Whatever they put in there is going to create a new flavor, right? Um, it's, it's like how you season a dish. No two people are going to season it the same way. Um, and then, you know, apart from the uh, domesticated agaves, um, people are using a whole variety of wild agaves that they find naturally growing in whatever environment that they live. Um, and you can see some of these are, are pretty um, daunting plants to cut um, because they're all cut manually. They don't have special tools. It's usually a guy with a, <laughs> a hatchet or, you know, uh, it's, it's pretty uh, 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 backbreaking work. Um, and some of these plants, you can see the one in the bottom um, left-hand corner, the tepestate, 
Um, they grow in really rocky places, sometimes on the sides of cliffs. People are, are having to go up with donkeys and get these things out. They're really hard to get. But again, they all have different flavors. I mean, even just looking at the, the, the plants, they don't even look the same, right? To say that they're agave, um, you know, the, the diversity within the category of, of agave is really, really wide. Um, in terms of the process of making the mezcal, as I mentioned before, when I talked about tequila, um, one of the reasons mezcal is smoky is that generally speaking, except for in probably some of the larger commercial brands, there's not that many, but there are a few. Um, with, the, with those few exceptions, the, um, most of the mezcal is produced, uh, the agave hearts are cut. You can see the guy up there, he's taking a machete to take off all the, the, the spiny leaves, right? Um, that heart is the part of the plant that contains all the sugars that will then be converted into alcohol. And to get those sugars cooked, they put them in an in-ground pit and that is, um, there's a fire. And again, thinking about flavor, depending on the kind of wood you use, it's just like when you smoke on a barbecue, you might use hickory or you might use cedar if you're making salmon, you're gonna get different flavors, right? So you keep thinking about like, it's like a, you're a chef putting on all of these little layers of flavor. And again, the combinations are almost infinite. So no two mezcals are gonna taste alike. Okay, those are the cooked hearts. Um, they're very sweet, they're caramelized. The sugar caramelizes as it's cooking. And um, you can, it almost tastes like candy. Sometimes you can see it in Mexican grocery stores, they'll sell um, um, cooked, cooked agave as, and kids will eat it as, as sort of a candy. Um, once those hearts are cooked, they're then crushed and they're crushed so that they can then be fermented. They have to be broken down for fermentation. The old quote unquote traditional way of doing this um, was using what's called a masa y canoa. And it's a pit in the ground and these giant wooden, they look like crazy baseball bats. And you literally stand over this pit and you pound them. And it is really awful work. But again, it's think about flavor, right? The difference between using a mortar and pestle to make salsa versus a blender, right? And those of you that cook will know different texture, different flavors are um, produced depending on what technology you're using. Um, another way of doing um, the, the crushing of the agave is using what's called a tajona, which is a giant stone wheel that's pulled around the circle by a horse. Um, that's probably the most, I'd say that's probably the most common in Oaxaca that you'll see. Um, the government, uh, when I was doing research, what year was it, 2015, um, had a pilot program to provide um, economic packages to small producers. And it was a whole, they called it a kit in Spanish, a kit. And they, one of the parts of the kit, in addition to fermentation bats and some other things was this, um, it's basically like a giant wood chipper, right? You could put your agave in, it would chip it up and sort of do it uh, in an automated fashion. So you weren't having to use the horse and you weren't having to use the, the mallets. Um, it was very controversial, I might add. <laughs> um, then fermentation, again, thinking about how you craft your product, you craft, you layer your flavors. Um, fermentation is another place that happens, right? Um, you, you'll hear like in terms of wine, people talk about, you know, the material, the kind of barrel that it's aged in or that the, the grapes are fermented in. Oak is often preferred, right, um, in the winemaking world. Um, in mezcal, people will often buy used um, wine uh, vats and repurpose them. I've seen people use whiskey vats from, um, from Tennessee to Kentucky. Um, one guy had a bunch of vats from Jim Beam that he acquired somehow that I interviewed. People use all kinds of crazy. I saw somebody use the old barrel of a washing machine to ferment their agave. Um, that, you know, somebody, had, I don't know where they got it. Um, plastic tubs. In the bottom picture there, those are cowhides. 
um, which ironically <laughs> produce a very chocolate finish on the skull. Uh, it's hard to imagine, but there's something about, I don't know, cow hides and chocolate. So a combination that uh, tastes better than it sounds. Um, and then you've got the distillation in different kinds of materials, um, ceramic, copper, stainless steel. Um, and these are just different pictures of that. I'm trying to keep my eye on the time here. I'm going to have to wrap it up soon, I think, so we have some time for questions. Um, so I'll just sort of, this is kind of the last thing I want to touch on. Um, there has been sort of recent um, attempts to regulate mescal apart from just the denomination of origin. And that was um, uh, attempted by creating three categories of mescal within the, the denomination of origin. And they created three labels. Um, one, it was initially gonna be called industrial mescal. This would actually have been printed on your bottle. Um, and not surprisingly, people that made quote unquote industrial mescal hated that term. <laughs> like nobody's gonna buy our product. So it was called mescal. So these are, these are like the big, the bigger brands. There's not that many of them, but the, you know, the people that use automated technology and, and commercial um, um, machinery, that sort of thing. Then there's something called artisanal mescal, which the, one of the primary characteristics is that it's distilled in copper, copper stills. And then there's something that's called ancestral mescal, which the key distinguishing feature is that it's actually um, distilled in, in um, uh, ceramic pots, right? Um, it's still not clear to me what the difference between ancestral and artisanal is in terms of the name. Ancestral, I'm like, what does that really mean? Ancestral to what? If there wasn't distillation in pre-Hispanic times, what, what ancestral past are they referencing? Because the, the clay pot technology and the copper stills would have been, um, you know, existing side by side. So it's kind of interesting that they've decided to call one ancestral. I think it's a marketing thing more than anything is to make um, one product seem more rustic and more valuable. And oftentimes the ancestral muscles do have a higher price tag because you're paying for the idea of it being more craft like or more rustic or, you know, you insert your word there. So one of the things that I'm grappling with is I write my book on mescal is what happens when you've got this really diverse craft or artisanal product and suddenly it goes global, right? Suddenly there's this huge global demand for it. People are wanting to buy your product all over the world. Um, and I'm kind of left wondering and grappling with this idea, how does mescal maintain its status as a craft? What is, what changes um, when a product like that, like you saw, enters into a global market and we start dealing with um, economies of, uh, of scale, right? Um, and so I'm gonna leave it there because I know we are kind of getting close to time. Um, if you wanna learn more, there are lots of great resources on the web. Here's a few that I, I would recommend. Um, and thank you for your time. If you have questions, there's my email and I'm happy to take some questions now as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rhonda. That was wonderful. I feel like I learned, I think I learned about a book, a book, amount of information in that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to need a drink after that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> if we were in person, we would have a tasting. Exactly. <laughs> and um, everybody just, I mean, I'm applauding. So please feel free to show your applause. And as, as the chat sort of fills up, I thought maybe just to, I have a question for you. How did you become interested in mescal as a, as a field of study for yourself? That's a great question. Um, so my previous work, um, I, I guess I've always, I've always worked in, in Southern Mexico and I've, um, my work has always focused on craft economy. And I started working, my first book was about um, Oaxacan wood carving artisans and so, you know, I really see this as an extension or growth of Oaxacan, the Oaxacan craft economy, which in its initial iteration was really focused around folk art, but I think is now 
come to encompass gastronomy and part of gastronomy, I think craft spirits, um, it's, it's sort of like the second wave of um, uh, artisan gentrification. <laughs> I'm calling it gastronomic gentrification in my book, but, um, and, and so that's one of the reasons. And then another reason is that um, I'm from a family of uh, fifth generation hop growers um, from the Pacific Northwest. And my family, um, when I was growing up, I grew up on a farm and, you know, my dad would make, you know, grow hops and we'd sell those hops to Anheuser Bush or Coors. Because back then, when I was a little kid in the 70s, those were the, that was the only game in town. All these craft beers that you go out and enjoy now, guess what? Didn't exist. There were not, there were a handful, like Sam Adams in Boston was one of the early craft breweries. There were not, there was not a craft brewing industry in the US in the 70s. That is all really recent. If I'd asked my sister, who's now running our farm 10 years ago, I said, you know, do you, would you sell to craft breweries? She, she, she'd shake her head and say, what a waste of time. That's not where the money is. You sell to the big breweries. Now, guess what? My sister, a large portion of her product goes to craft breweries because that has grown so rapidly in the past 15 years or so. So I think watching the development of the craft brewing industry also ties into this craft distillate industry that I'm, you know, looking at in, in, in this other location. Great. I'm always really interested in how scholars find their passion in their work. And oftentimes there's sort of a, a history, a family history in that, you know, there's something that was cultivated long ago in you that would bring you to this topic. Yeah, that was definitely my case. <laughs> So I'll sort of go through the question. So William asked, could you mention one more, one more time the name of the artist that you said was leading an artisanal movement? Uh, the, so the artist that, that imported in 1995 some of the first Mescal, um, his name's Ron Cooper. And he's, I mean, he's still in Taos. He's, uh, he's from California originally. Um, his brand that he started is called Del Maguey. And if you go into a store and you see these green bottles with this very distinctive artwork on it, um, that's his brand. He's now sold it to, it, it belongs to a big, I can't remember if it's uh, Constellation Brands. He sold his brand off um, to a bigger company. Honestly, it's not really his anymore in that sense, but he started that. Hmm. And a lot of the, the mezcal brands, the, the artisanal brands were started by artists. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, you know, so I think there's a tie between, um, you know, seeing the art in Mescal is, you know, um, I saw it described in one book as drinkable folk art, which oh. there's some connection there that I'm, I'm still fleshing out. Yeah, that's a great, great phrase. Okay, so Matthew says, do you have any information on Bacanora or Raicilla? I heard that Bacanora was prohibited for some reason, and is Raicilla also a Mescal? Yeah, um, so Bacanora is, is produced in Sonora. Um, I don't know that much about it. It's starting to become popular. If you go to Arizona, you can get it. Um, one of the issues, um, I, I think we're not aware that how much where you live in the United States um, impacts what's available to you, particularly around um, products that are heavily regulated like alcohol, right? Um, the tax, the taxation structure for alcohol coming from other countries varies from state to state. New Mexico is not a great place if you want to try a variety of things. We actually have a lot less things available to us because um, the way alcohol is taxed and our transportation networks um, and also consumer demands not high here. We're a small state. Like if you really wanted to get your hands on you know, all these different varieties and have lots of different brands. You know, Texas is a great place. A lot of the Mexican producers ship their product into the port of Houston and cargo, it's these cargo boats, um, California. Um, so we just can't get Bacanota here, but if you went to Arizona, you can get it. I think it's probably a matter of time. Um, we can get Sotol here because of the connection with Chihuahua. And what about and Raicia, Raicia is also a type of, of mezcal and it's becoming 
more and more popular too. That's produced in Jalisco, I believe. Maybe Guerrero, I can't remember. Great, thanks. So Marigold says, how does a community or region get a denomination of origin? Who does the work? Who is involved? I um, mean, if you could talk about this in terms of mezcal and the politics that you mentioned. Yeah, that is a mystery to me. Um, like many things in Mexico at the bureaucratic level, it's, um, you know, I would imagine it, it, you know, I don't know, it probably involves somebody having a lot of money and a lot of political clout. Um, I know, I've heard that the, the state of Tamaulipas got um, the tequila designation because there was, I don't know if it was a, the governor at the time who was tied to, you know, cartels and had a lot of money and a lot of uh, influence in various ways demanded that they get the, the don, denomination and it, ha and it happened, right? So I think from place to place, it's hard to know. Um, one thing that nobody really talks about, um, and I'm hesitant to write much about it, is that some, there's, there's a real connection here. Um, and I'm not saying that these are the same people running cartels, but there is a connection between the drug industry in Mexico and the spirits industry. Um, in the sense that like some of the um, early brands, the mezcal producers in Oaxaca, they, they're, they openly will talk about having been involved in the narcotics, uh, in narcotics trade. Um, and many of these communities that are producing mezcal also have a narcotics trade. So um, that is something that nobody's touched, um, probably for good reason. Um, but it's definitely um, in, in the highlands of Jalisco, same thing. Um, a lot of the communities I visited during field work also grow marijuana, they grow opiates. Um, it's, you know, these are rural people that are living in pretty, um, you know, bad economic circumstances, and, and that's what they do to, to make a living. Great, thanks. I um, mean, if I skip over your question, I'm just going to try to get to questions one question for everybody. So let's see if I can do that. So Carlos asks, do you see any similar growth potential for Soto or Bacanora? Yeah, um, um, Bacanora is really taken off in Arizona. Um, again, I think it's because it's a you know border state. Um, Soto, uh, there was an article, I can't remember if it was in Forbes or New York Times pretty recently, and it declared that Mescal was over. Like, okay, <laughs> we moved past that and Soto is the new hot thing. Um, and whether that that's true or not, I, I think it, it has real potential. Um, I don't think, you know, we're in the middle of the country. We tend to get a lot of these food trends and drink trends a lot later than places like Los Angeles. So it's like fashion, you know, it starts on the coast and it kind of works its way towards the center of the country. But I think those drinks are, are, are starting to have their moment. So Joe at, says, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Hidalgo, and they're very proud of their pulque there. Is there a reason why there aren't as many exports of pulque? Pulque is a hard one because it's a fresh beverage, <clears throat> and it doesn't have preservatives. So um, it's basically the agave sap that sits there, and it, it ferments with the, the natural yeast in the air. And one of the reasons they haven't been able to distribute too far is that it simply, they can't, there's no way to ship it, it'll go bad. And I've seen pulque in a can. I bought some at the El Super one time and it was, it was nasty, I don't recommend it. Um, but it's, it's a question of, um, it's, doesn't, it's not a preserve, it doesn't have uh, the shelf life, you can't really transport it. So it's kind of, that's something that stayed very local. So particularly Mar central Mexico. So Marcela says, you mentioned the shredders that were provided to producers as part of the government's assistance program. Can you explain, you know, oh, that they were controversial. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, because this is, um, this is, you know, craft mezcal. And it's like a lot of things. When I did my research on wood carvers, right? The, the tourist buying the wood carving or the, the consumer buying the wood carving, you don't want to see the guy there with the power tools making your wood carving. You want to see him hunched over, hand carving. You want this non-mechanized production. Um, there's a whole theoretical argument that, you know, kind of behind that. But 
in this you know, modern age, I think craft represents something that we feel has been lost. And you don't, same thing with your mescal, you don't want a guy with a wood chipper making your mescal. You want the guy with the mallet that's there pounding away. It's part of a, a fantasy, I think, that consumers have about how things are produced. And the, the rustic nature has its own intrinsic value in this global market where things are so mechanized and anonymous. Hmm. So this is sort of related and Stephen asked, can the, can the use of the Tahona wheel to crush the agave be considered an ancestral trait? So how is process related to, I guess? Yeah, I mean, those yeah. terms are, those terms are kind of, and that's, you know, people sit and debate them. What does it mean to say artisanal ancestral? I mean, what, an, what ancestral past are we talking about? The colonial period? Are we talking about the pre-Hispanic? You know, we're not talking about pre-Hispanic because they weren't making mescal, um, according to most archaeologists. Um, it's the the technology of, of crushing. You know, it's um, you know I, I don't know why they they decided that was fit with that label. It's you know these are people that you know these these this came down to fist fights at meetings <laughs> in Oaxaca about who, who, what was going to be named what and what were the traits uh, attached with each category. Mm. Um, so I hope that answered that. <laughs> so I have an interesting question from Nathan. So could you speak more to the gentrification of mezcal? It started with Ron Cooper and now you have George Clooney selling mezcal through Casamigos. Non-Mexicans are selling books, owning mezcal bars in the U.S. and promoting uh, from the popularity of mezcal. So can you talk a little bit about how you, how you look at that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the big question in the mezcal world is, will it go the way of tequila, right? And there's an, anybody that's really interested in this, there's a, a pretty good book. It's written by a, a food and wine journalist. It's called How the Gringos Stole Tequila. And it talks about the whole um, co-optation of the tequila industry by sort of multinational corporations, largely based in the United States. And you're starting to see that with mezcal in that, um, when I when I uh, was doing this field work over the past ten years, um, we used to have we used to have a joke amongst anthropologists. Um, it went something like, "What does every indigenous household in Oaxaca have?" And the the punchline was an anthropologist. Um, and now, if you asked, "What uh, sort of like what is every gringo that you're seeing on the streets of Oaxaca here for?" And it's because they're starting a mezcal brand, right? Um, you can't spit without hitting somebody that's got, just seems to have a lot of cash and they're walking around to find their producer that's gonna produce their mezcal. So the brands that are, I would say most economically viable or successful, able to get certification, commercialized nationally and internationally are those that have foreign capital or capital from outside of Oaxaca, you know, investors from Mexico City um, or a lot of investors from the United States. So. That's where the money comes from to get to create a brand. Just having a good product doesn't mean you can get it to market. Um, you might be able to sell it to your neighbor down the street, but it doesn't mean it's going to get into a mezcal bar in New York City. Um, and that's that's where there's the potential for the industry to head in that direction. Great. We have this great chat going on, and we will save this chat where people are sort of recommending what they like and don't like. Um, and so I'm just kind of through that to, we can probably get to a couple more questions and I want to make sure that we do that. So let me drop down to Sam's question. Would you say that the connection with mezcal and narcotics, et cetera, the fact that those working in one industry often work with the other have to do with the fact that the enterprises profit from experience in managing similar distribution networks? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Um... No, I'd have to think about that. I mean, I think there's also, you know, at different points, mezcal was illegal, right? Like there's been prohibitions of alcohol, um, both in the United States and in Mexico. And, you know, the, the, some of these old guys that I worked with talked about, they remember, you know, federal police coming in, smashing their stills. So there's this illicit nature of, of, of mescal production that has a historical basis and maybe, you know, 
maybe they establish networks to to get their their product around. I don't know that I don't really have a good answer, but that would be something to look into. Mm. Thanks, Sam. Let's see. And I think maybe we'll take one more that is actually a couple of questions. This is from Alexandra. Um, let's see. Wanted to know if you could speak to the how if the boom in mezcal consumption has improved the livelihoods of producers at all. And then a second question on a different note, is climate change a threat uh, or on the minds of growers in Oaxaca? Okay, so that's the million dollar question. Are people getting, are people quote unquote better off because of mezcal? And I always say it depends where you're positioned in the supply and production chain, right? Um, if you're a guy that drives a truck that's hauling agave hearts to some little podunk, <laughs> you're probably not, I mean, you're probably making, you know, very low wages doing driving a truck, right? Um, I think the people that are profiting the most probably are, and it, it's sort of like this, again, it's why I think it very much parallels the folk art market. If you find a patron, a patron that is going to invest in your product, um, you know, you will see households and communities that have done much better. And they're usually the ones with the shiny new pickup truck and the satellite TV dish on their house and um, which creates a whole nother set of issues because it creates class hierarchies within this sort of traditional village structure in a place like Oaxaca. Um, and that happened with folk arts too, where people become very famous and they build a giant house to keep their neighbors out and suddenly they're not part of the community. And you see that you're seeing that with mezcal. So some people are better off, some people are still struggling. So it really just depends where you are. Climate change, that's a real issue. Um, you know, those of you that follow tequila might remember a few years ago, there was this crazy like freeze and it destroyed like all of the plants one year, like their whole crop was wiped out. And you got to remember tequila is a monocrop industry, right? It's not like you can, you've got a backup to, you know, agave you can put in. And so actually the tequileros were going down to Oaxaca um, illegally and buying um, Oaxacan agaves, bringing them back up to tequila and making tequila out of them, which is illegal because it's not the same agave. But yeah, climate change is impacting, um, you know, growing cycles. Um, there's a lot of poaching of agave that goes on. There's all kinds of things that um, people will have post people with guns outside their fields because people will come and steal them. Um, it's, it can be pretty, uh, it can be risky business. Do, do you know what, I'm sure this varies, but what a life cycle of the agave plant is, does it vary between different species or kinds or is it common? Yeah, so, and that's actually another thing that makes it hard for small producers to, to profit in the industry. You have a, a average agave for it to become mature in order to produce mescal um, takes somewhere between, the espadine takes between six to eight years to reach maturity. That's on the low, that's on the short side. Those big tepestate plants I showed you in that one side of the wild agaves, those sometimes don't mature until they're 13, 14 years old. So if you're thinking about a farmer, you're a very small scale campesino, you're having to, if you're gonna grow your own raw materials, you're having to invest and farm something looking forward six to eight years. That's a really risky thing to do, right? for a non-subsistence crop. From a farming standpoint, it's, it's really tough, right? Because you don't know what an industry is gonna look like six years or eight years down the road from now, right? Maybe people stop buying the skull. So um, the life cycle is, is really, really critical. And you can only use a mezcal plant once, they don't come back. So you cut down that 13-year-old tepestate and that's it. You get you know, a couple bottles of, of mezcal out of it and then it's gone. Ah, oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, Rhonda, thank you so much. I'm sorry I didn't get to every single question, but everyone, if you could unmute yourselves now and applaud or give Rhonda some feedback. I thought that was absolutely wonderful. Um, really informative. Thank you so very much. Thank you everyone for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, Rhonda. There is, um, we put in the chat, uh, you can take a quick survey, which is really helpful to us again, so we can make sure that we're very responsive to your needs. And uh, so giving your 
feedback. It's a form that'll take you about one minute. So again, Rhonda, thank you. And I wanna tell all of you that um, our last talk in the series is Tuesday, May the 4th. And that's gonna be a UNM's Kimberly Gowderman. And the title is Seeking Refuge, the Role of Expert Witnesses in Latin American Asylum Cases. So another great topic, another Tuesday evening. UNM, thank you so much. We love you as partners. Rhonda, thank you again. And thank you to my staff in HLA. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. And we'll see you next month. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.